The following is a message from Christ Central Manchester, a church that meets in the heart of Manchester in the UK. To find out more about us, please visit www.christcentral.org.uk. This morning, our question is God and sex. Or what does God think about sex? I spoke to one or two of you before the meeting and said it was going to be a bit of a juicy morning this morning. And uh, there, there we go. So... The question really is, what's God's opinion? What does God think in a day and age, no, just like any other, where sex is, um, sex is obviously something that people are either consumed with sometimes or focused on or is just unavoidable that we're going to talk about it or uh, be kind of faced with it on billboards and things like that. The whole area, what does God think? What does God really think? What does the Bible really think? And a quick answer really lies in the context of creation. God created the heavens and the earth. There will be disagreement <coughs> amongst us as to how long he took. Some of you will think he took literally seven 24-hour segments to create the world. Some of you will think he took a lot longer than that. But the, hopefully the, we can all agree that God created it. But we can go there. No one's going to hopefully have a fight about the rest of it. But we can all agree that God created the heavens and the stars and the sea, the sky, the trees, the animals, of the, and of course people. He created people like you and me. And he created the means by which people would reproduce. Genesis 1 verse 28, be fruitful and increase in number. He said at the conclusion of that sixth day that it was all good. So that means that not only people, but the way that people multiply, procreation, is all good. In Genesis 2, we then hone in on the creation of people, of Adam and Eve. And we see that it was not just about increasing in number, procreation, but the focus is on community and the close bond between a man and a woman in, in marriage. Now, in turn, that would also speak more broadly of the need that we have as human beings for community, the need that we have for each other. So that even if someone is, quote unquote, a bit of a loner, or someone's a bit of a, uh, likes their own company, likes to be, you know, their way of relaxing is just to be on their own, even those kind of people, even the, low, even the, the, the most extreme person that we would maybe say is a bit of a loner, even they need people. So in our... In the UK in particular at the moment, we have a crisis with people in latter life who, who may be okay financially, people are living longer because of fi- uh, medical advances, and they might be okay financially, they might be okay medically, they might be looked after in every way you can imagine, except that they're lonely, because they're not able to get out very much, and there's nobody around anymore. And so there's a loneliness crisis in... Uh, later life for many people in the UK. They just need people. They don't necessarily need anything doing for them. They just need conversation. It speaks of this desire, inbuilt desire that God has put in us for community. We need each other. And marriage, spoken about there in Genesis 2, is just one expression of it. But the point I'm trying to make underneath all of this is, God said it was all good. Community is good. Togetherness is good. Reproduction is good. Genesis 2.24, that then Jesus quotes in Mark and Matthew, Matthew's Gospels, in Mark's Gospel and Matthew's Gospel, when he speaks against the contemporary view of divorce, he says this in quotation. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. For sex is for reproduction... And it's also for uniting a married couple as one flesh. And God said, all good. Is sex a taboo subject for God? No. Is, sex, is God a bit embarrassed about sex? No. Sometimes we are, historically. I would say we suffer sometimes when we get shy or embarrassed about sex and talking about it. And the fact that I'm even saying the word on a Sunday morning for some of you is... Breaking some of those barriers. <laughs> I think when we're embarrassed about it or shy about it, we're suffering from what I would call a Genesis 3 or post-Genesis 3 syndrome. In Genesis 2 verse 25, man and woman were naked and were very happy about it. 
After they disobey God in, in Genesis 3, what we call the fall of humankind, suddenly they realise that they are naked and they put clothes on. Suddenly they're embarrassed about their nudity. Does that mean that we should all try and get back to Genesis 2 and all go a bit naturist? No. Does that mean that we can be crude about sex in conversation? No. Does that mean that we can talk about it freely? Yes. I believe it does. God is not embarrassed about it. We need not be embarrassed about it either. The church, us, and the church in the UK, I think, needs to shake off a reputation it's got for always being against something, especially in the area of sex. We're always coming out and saying something about what we're against. We're always coming out and saying something negative. It's time to be celebratory and positive and encouraging society to God's good in it all, whilst at the same time pointing society to Jesus, who we all desperately need. If, for me, if God regretted creating sex, or if he was a little bit embarrassed about creating sex, like, what are they doing? If he was a bit like that about it, then Song of Solomon would not be in the Bible. Have you ever read Song of Solomon? We're going to do that in a moment. If it was illustrated, you'd need to put a certificate on the Bible. I mean, an age certificate. So if God has no problem with sex, if God doesn't regret creating it as part of his overall creation... Is the problem therefore with us? And I would say, yes, it definitely is, has been. And what has been our approach historically? Well, I think our approach historically, I would suggest, goes into three categories. We're going to go through these and then we're going to get on to what's good about it. First of all, in history, we've seen sex as dirty. Then we've seen sex as an idol, and those two can be reacting to each other. So one generation worships sex as an idol and the next generation reacts and says it's dirty and then the next generation, generation reacts to that and worships it again as an idol. We kind of saw it in the 20th century, kind of during the 50s, 60s and 70s, we kind of went in and out of this react reactionary process. And then thirdly, we're going to look at sex as good and as God designed it. So number one, sex is dirty. As I've said already, in, in reaction often to sex being worshipped, Sex has been seen as disgusting, dirty, to be avoided. Typical kind of Victorian stance, you know, that kind of Victorian caricature that we would know of, especially in the UK. Or even that kind of fundamentalist religious group approach to sex that would say, you know, going to the cinema is bad, playing rock music or modern music is bad, and sex is bad, so save it for the one you love. That kind of approach, which is so helpful. Historically, this, it, this stance on sex has had some bizarre expressions. If they weren't, they'd be funny if they weren't true. Let me give you some examples. The Greek Stoics had had such an influence on the early church that the, the kind of body and spirit are divided, that the body is bad, that the toilet is kind of dirty and bad, and, then, and sex is bad because that's physical. A marital, a marital intimacy between husband and wife, sex in marriage is bad. So, for example, Tertullian and Ambrose, two early church fathers, said that they prefer the extinction of the human race to continued marital sexual intercourse. Gets worse. Oregon allegorized the Song of Solomon, as many people have done, and there is definitely themes of Jesus and his church in the Song of Songs, but it's also initially about a husband and his wife he took the part where Jesus says, if it causes you to sin, cut it off literally, and castrated himself. Now that is an option. Chrysostom, I'm just going to leave it there. Chrysostom, John Chrysostom, who's a fantastic, eloquent preacher from the early church father's era, early few centuries, and I'd recommend his sermons if you can kind of get your head around the, the language. He said Adam and Eve, so he was brilliant in many ways, but listen to this. He said Adam and Eve didn't have sex before the fall. Jerome, another early church father, would, would throw himself in thorn bushes to sort of, I don't know, sort of discipline himself. Maybe he'd had some lustful thoughts or something. Again, it's an option. Gregory of, of Nyssa believed that Adam and Eve again had, didn't have sex at all. 
or at least before the fall, and that there was a special tree in the Garden of Eden, and if they ate of that fruit, Eve would become pregnant. It's not in the Bible, but they, they were so determined that sex was dirty that they went there. In the Middle Ages, skipping ahead, um, by the 5th century, priests could not marry, and sex was just seen for procreation and nothing else. The Catholic Church then wrote manuals on what a man and a, a husband and wife could do in the bedroom. And they made a calendar full of days off. Days off from sex. All regulating sex because it's wrong. In 1525, this was still the scene. And the wonderful couple, Catherine von Bora and Martin Luther. She was a nun. And he was a monk. They were no longer mun and mun and nunk. They were no longer nun and monk the day they got married. It was a scandal. They'd come out of their celibacy. And the belief was floating around Christendom at the time that their first baby would be a two-headed monster because of this terrible thing they'd done. Then we hit the Victorian era. And I want you to hear the Christian advice given in 1894. And I may have... Given you this, I may have read this to you before, it's hilarious. If it weren't true, it's terrible. In 1894, Ruth Smithers, wife of Reverend L.D. Smithers, or Smithers, I prefer, in a short book with a long title called, and this is the title, Instruction and Advice for the Young Bride on the Conduct and Procedure of the Intimate and Personal Relationships of the Marriage State for the Greater Spiritual Sanctity of this Blessed Sacrament and the Glory of God. That's the title. They didn't have short titles back then. She writes, to the, to the sensitive young woman who has had the benefits of proper upbringing, the wedding day is ironically both the happiest and most terrifying day of her life. On the positive side, there is the wedding itself, in which the bride is the central attraction in a beautiful and inspiring ceremony, symbolizing her triumph in securing a male to provide for all her needs for the rest of her life. On the negative side, there is the wedding night, during which the bride must pay the piper, so to speak, by facing, listen up, it gets worse, by facing for the first time the terrible experience of sex. At this point, dear reader, let me concede one shocking truth. Some women, some young women, actually anticipate the wedding night ordeal with curiosity and pleasure. Beware such an attitude. A selfish and sensual husband because men are all just perverts. A sensual and sensual husband can easily take advantage of such a bride. One cardinal rule of marriage should never be forgotten. And I prefer to think of Winston Churchill saying this at this point. Give little, give seldom, and above all, give grudgingly. <laughs> We're on the beaches, and we will fight them in the fields. Give grudgingly. Otherwise, what could have been a proper marriage could become an orgy of sexual lust. <laughs> Thanks ever so much, Mrs. Smithers. You've done so much for the church in history and given us a good laugh this morning. Worth saying that, in all seriousness at this point, that this kind of nervous and negative attitude towards sex in marital intimacy can come about because of negative experiences from your past. And therefore, it's very understandable that you find the whole thing difficult, dirty, because sin was committed against you. So as I said already, it's understandable that, that you might feel like that about it. But that is not God's best for you. Sex itself is not evil. What you may have experienced probably was evil. And you need your mind renewing biblically to get God's perspective on it. Also, you may need help and prayer to get through this. So please do talk to someone. Please uh, find your community group leader or one of the other leaders here at the church. We'd love to help you through on these things if that's true for you. But generally speaking, that approach in history of seeing it as just dirty has been so unhelpful. And that's a really mild way of putting it. It's been a robbery from people, that Satan has robbed people of something good, a gift that God has given, and that approach has robbed humanity over the centuries. Also, just to say, 
whilst we're kind of in this, in this moment. There are times when physical illness or other issues arise that, that mean that sex is either different or not, or not even possible. And again, we're really committed to walking that through with couples that are just struggling. And there is to be no shame that actually physical illness means that it's not, not the same or it's not even happening. So just wanted to mention that as well. And again, if you want help, please do speak up. But that's, that's the first approach historically and, and still, sadly, can be the approach for many people today. Secondly, there is the approach that makes sex into a god to be worshipped, sex as an idol. Again, that can be a reaction. Or well, it can just come out of selfishness over the centuries. It's just been about enjoyment and uh, worshipping ourselves. Worshipping sex as an idol, in the end, comes back to um, replacing God with some other things and putting our own selfish needs before worship of Him. It's the stuff of the Da Vinci Code with sexual acts included, included in the ceremonies. It's in... It's in the days of Solomon, uh, Israel surrounded by Canaanite um, religion that had sexual uh, acts included in their ceremonies as well. We then see in the New Testament sex being worshipped at the Greek temples with sex slaves. Apparently paedophilia was prevalent and accepted as well in Greek culture. In Corinth, the temple of Aphrodite had a thousand prostitutes serving there. So you can see why Paul, when he writes the Bible letter to Corinthians, has to address the whole topic. He says, you can't have sex with your stepmom. You can't have sex before or outside of marriage. He has to lay down the, the rules, as it were, because God best, because of the confusion that was surrounding the church in Corinth. And today we have this same worship of sex. It's all around us. And worship ends up meaning you give yourself to it in terms of time, Money, allegiance. Just one example, and it's only one, is the whole porn industry. $60 billion globally is spent on the porn industry annually. $12 billion in the USA alone, which is more than their three major sports put together. 12% of internet sites, 25% of search engine requests, 40% of internet users, 20% of men at work admit to looking at it, 13% of women at work, $3,000 per second, 10,000 viewers every second, 90% of children aged 8 to 16 are viewed porn online, and the average child sees pornography, pornography for the first time online at the age of 11, usually inadvertently. The number one consumer of pornography is boys aged 12 to 17. So we probably need to be talking about sex with our children earlier than we might have thought, sadly. And hence the need to get God's perspective on it this morning. It's only one area where we worship sex as a society. Obviously, it's other areas as well. It's going from one sexual encounter to another in search of something or in worship of it. It's marriages breaking down because of a worship of sex. Sex is seen as a god, as an idol to worship, and it's not different today than it's been for the last couple of thousand years. And I'm not standing here in, if you're struggling, I'm not standing here judging you. I'm not saying sexual sin is somehow worse than other sin, which is, again, comes through from this theme that sex is dirty. Sexual sin has consequences that other sin may not have. But it's not like an elite sin up there with murder. God forgives sin. It doesn't say he takes a bit longer to forgive certain sins. The consequences will be different for different sin. And if you are in a situation or struggling in an area, again, speak up. There will not be shame here. If there is, I'll deal with that. We'll deal with that as a leadership. It should be no shame. You're cocooned in, remember? You're loved. You're a son or a daughter of the, of the Father. So if there is stuff going on, don't keep quiet. Ask for help. We'd love to help you, not to judge you, but to help you. So sex is either dirty 
or an idol? Is there another way? Please, God, let there be another way. Is there another way through? Yes, there is. Where we can get back to Genesis 2, again, not with wanting to go naturist, but is there, another, is there a way of getting back to Genesis 2 and how God intended sex to be in the first place? How does God... How does God, you might have thought this question earlier when I was talking about it. How does God, knowing about all the sexual sin in and around Israel, still inspire the writing of Song of Songs? And the bigger question, surely he must regret it, inventing this thing. Surely he must regret it. Surely, with all that goes on, and it has gone on for the last couple of thousand years, surely he must regret it. With all the wrong that's been done in this area, he must regret it. But it would have wiped out the whole whole of humanity Full stop. For all that we do to each other, that is wrong. One, you know, wars, abuse of power, greed, the, the, the terrible wrongdoing and sin that goes on in the name of anything, not just this area. He would have wiped us out. He incredibly wants the good stuff he's created to keep coming through and provided the way through by Jesus dying on the cross. We could spend longer on that, but we haven't got the time. Where can we go for an example of how God sees sex? I've said it already. Let's go there. Song of Solomon. Song of Songs. Let's read chapter 1 of Song of Songs. The words will be on the screen. And then we're just going to make some observations and then we're going to finish. Solomon's Song of Songs. Or kind of like King of Kings, like the best of the best. This is the, this is the poem that he really enjoyed writing. <laughs> and she really enjoyed writing. She kicks us off. She says, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Remember, this is the, this is the good version of what God has created. Verse 3. Pleasing is the fragrance of your perfumes. Your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the young women love you. No wonder you're admired. No wonder you're a catch. Take me away with you, let us hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. Then their friends keep piping up as you go through Song of Songs. Their friends keep chiping. It's like the the, the wedding uh, party. They keep chipping in. We rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. And then she says again, how right they are to adore you. Dark am I, yet lovely, daughters of Jerusalem. Dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tents curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons were angry with me and made me take care of the vineyards, my own vineyard I had to neglect. Tell me, you whom I love, where you graze your flock and where you rest your sheep at midday. Why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? In all of that, she's saying, affluent, the affluent ideal in that day and age was paler skin because it meant you were indoors. She'd been out in the fields, manually working, dirt in her fingernails. And she looks down upon herself because of the way she looks, because she wasn't the cultural standard of beauty. And then she's saying in verse 7, let's get together. She's initiating, we want to put this in the diary, get together. I don't want to come along all dressed up like a veiled woman and find you just with your mates. I want to make sure we get proper time together. Then... The friends pipe up again in verse 8. If you do not know, most beautiful of women, follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your young goats by the tents of the shepherds. Solomon, for the first time, says in verse 9, I liken you, my darling, to a mare. He's not calling her a horse. Okay? Because that sounds funny, doesn't it? I mean, doesn't it? He's saying, like a mare among Pharaoh's chariot horses, you get me going. It's in the Bible. Verse 10, your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. Verse 11, we will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. She then says, while the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh resting between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of En Gedi. He then says, how beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful your eyes are doves. She says, how handsome you are, my beloved. Oh, how charming And our bed is verdant. The ESV study Bible, written in dry, scholarly, bookshelf-laden offices. I'm trying to describe, you know what I mean. Very boring rooms, very boring institutions, 
where they write things like the ESV Study Bible, they describe chapters 4, 5, and 7, and I think chapter 1 is a warm-up, they describe chapters 4, 5, and 7 of Song of Songs as a couple who take erotic delight in each other's physical appearance. Steady on, guys. You're supposed to be scholars and boring. As I said, they're definitely warming up in chapter 1 that we've just read. Let me just make a couple of observations, I think just four, four themes that I'll pick out very quickly. Number one, there is freedom. When sex is seen as good, there is freedom. Verse two, who speaks first? She does. She speaks freely, she speaks first, she I think speaks last in the Song of Songs, she speaks the most in the Song of Songs. There's no defensive, I've got a headache, I'm washing my hair, I'm a bit, just leave me alone. There's none of that going on. Most of you are looking at me like I'm an idiot. It's not the way it has to be. And she isn't like that. She's on the offensive, if you like. She's on the initiative taking. She's passionate, she's free, she's liberal with her affections. Does that make her dirty? Apparently it makes her godly. Second theme is, she says, kissing is good. Kiss me lots, kiss me often, kiss me right now. She says at the beginning. Sounds all right? Kissing is good. It's a healthy sign. If you have children, it's, good for, it's embarrassing for them as they get older, but it's very healthy for them to see their parents kissing. I didn't like those moments when I was growing up, but I know it was a good thing that my mum and dad were still liked each other. Just don't like to think about it very much. As, as soon as you start arguing, you, you stop kissing, right? And it's not the kind of kiss of a 50s... 1950s stage screen kind of kiss, it's kissing, proper kissing. And a proper kiss is a passionate kiss. Apparently good kissing prevents illness by building up immunity, where you swap saliva. Apparently good kissing burns calories, three, per, three calories per good snog apparently. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> In 12, actually it doesn't get any kind of less hot under the collar. In verses 12 to 14 we read about this place called En Gedi, which is a place of rest, a place of fruitfulness, like, a, like an oasis. And En Gedi for him, it would seem, is between her breasts. We see a description like, uh, like a nard, a perfume, where she talks about the myrrh between her breasts that would melt from the body heat and give off a perfume. And that's where he loves to spend a lot of, the, of his time, it would seem. You might be surprised that the Bible would talk about these things, and it does in Song of Songs a lot. If you were to go further into Song of Songs, it gets even more descriptive. Christians get uncomfortable or begin to giggle like, small, like school children <laughs> at this point. Actually, Christians can then go allegorical about it because it's a lot more comfortable just about Jesus and the church, Song of Songs. Or they can go allegorical in, in particular about this kind of verse where the word breast is mentioned. They could say things like, it's to do with the Shekinah glory between the two cherubim of the Ark of the Covenant. That's what's been talked about. Or it's about the Old Testament and the New Testament. Or the sachet of myrrh is Christ between the Old and New Testament. That's where people can go with it. Amazing. It's a woman who shares her body with her husband, primarily, or initially, at least. Yes, you can bring in allegory about Christ and the church, but it is initially about a woman and a man, husband and wife, sharing their bodies with each other, becoming one flesh, as it says in Genesis 2, and as Jesus very happily quotes. He wasn't married, he was happy to quote it, though. Fourthly, fourth thing to just pull out, Happiness and holiness. Now this isn't really explicitly in the, in, the, in the chapter that we've just read, but I just wanted to go here. If you go into a marriage thinking it will make me happy, or it will give me sexual fulfilment, and that's your primary objective, primary aim, happiness, fulfilment, physically, emotionally, romantically, two sinners going into a marriage with that intention don't automatically live happily ever after. Two people, even if they're Christians, who, who will from time to time get it wrong, 
We'll have conflict. We'll have difficulty. And if you go into a marriage with the false illusion of he's just going to make me happy or she's just going to make me happy, at some point you're going to think, I must have married the wrong person because I'm not happy. Maybe, actually, in the end, you're the problem and not them. Or at least, you're both the problem. If marriage, though, is for holiness first, and living for God first, just as singleness is, and I've talked about that on a previous occasion, 1 Corinthians 7, massive chapter about singleness and how great it is in terms of what it releases you into. Now, I know singleness comes with its challenges. But if you go into singleness or marriage thinking, I just want happiness, well, it's not going to quite work out for you. Because life isn't always happy. If we go into marriage for holiness first, living for God first, as we go into singleness, living for God first, then we don't give up during the rough times. Some people say, I want to stay single. Paul did this again in 1 Corinthians 7. I want to stay single so that I've got more time to devote to what God wants me to do. But it, which is great and true. But it's also true to say that marriage is also a ministry. We can be single to serve Jesus and become more like him. Or we can get married to serve Jesus and become more like him. You will grow in your holiness, hopefully, in marriage. As you will grow in your holiness, hopefully, as a single. I want to praise and encourage those of you here this morning who are single and who choose to honour God in your singleness by not chasing after the idol of sex or sex as an idol. Your exemplary commitment to God and his word in the face of sacrifice out of love for Jesus, not out of ticking boxes and rule keeping, but out of a love for Jesus cocooned into the fact that you are his son and daughter or daughter. I want to commend you for running that race. And if you've fallen, God will forgive you and pick you up. And I want to commend you for getting up and going again. In closing, sex has been labelled as dirty or it's been worshipped as a God. Sex as God intends is to be seen as good Enjoyable, pleasurable, as well as for procreation between a married couple, Genesis 2. God is very, very clear that, between, in, that in that context, sex is all good. We've then seen what it is to be about in the way that God intended it, or we've had a brief look at what it can be about, and some of the themes there in, in chapter 1 of Song of Songs. Friends, let's not be ashamed. Let's not be embarrassed. Let's... Not be known more for our negative words about this whole area than we are for our positive. Be the least embarrassed when this topic comes up at work or, in, or, or down the pub or wherever you are. Be the one who's the least ashamed or least, least kind of shy about it. Don't get involved in the crude conversations. Find convenient exits when it goes crude and dirty. And the, you know, but, but be the one who's ready to talk about it because it's good. It's good. Sex is good. As Christians, we can say that. <coughs> It isn't always, but as God intended it, it is. Be the least embarrassed. The church, as I've said already, needs to lead in this area. Not ashamedly cower behind and, and let society run away into the next expression that they want in this area. Let's go for the best. Let's go for God's best. Again, to repeat what I said earlier, if you need help, please ask for it. Please get it, whether you're married or not. If you need help, please, let's talk, let's pray, let's seek God's best for our lives. I'm not going to do a big appeal this morning. But please don't let the weeks go by where you don't ask for help if you need it. If the band would like to come up, we're going to worship. And you think, well, how can we go back into worship after that? As with anything... This comes out of our relationship with him. As I've said already, single or married, we're living for Jesus. As we worship in a moment, the offering buckets will go around. If you're a guest with us, please let them pass you by. Except that we'd love to hear from you in terms of the connect cards that uh, Tina mentioned earlier. We'd love to hear feedback. I'd love to 
hear your feedback, even about what I've been saying this morning, if you found it unhelpful or helpful. Be nice, but, but please be honest. Um, like we do appreciate feedback about the whole morning, about all that's going on. If you are a guest or new and you'd like to just sign up for something that you've heard about, please do that. If you just want to let us know your details so that we can keep you informed as to what's happening, we won't badger you, but we can just uh, keep in touch with you. Before I hand over to the band, I just want to list... I'm going to, I'm going to put it on social media, I'm going to put it on Twitter, and I think it should go on Facebook as well, on our church... Uh, Twitter feed and our church Facebook page, a couple of books that will be helpful. I'll actually add a couple more, but these are two that I just wanted to mention this morning. You can make a note. The top one, Intended for Pleasure, is specific. Is a f- fantastic book, highly recommend it. Um, it's specifically talking about how to enjoy sex in marriage. Um, and the whole physical side of it. it takes you through different seasons where it can be difficult. I talked earlier about physical side of things or f- when physical illness can be, uh, make things difficult. It talk- I think it even has a chapter about uh, later life and how things change. Um, really helpful book. Uh, actually, I think it, it's now a free PDF. You can get, if you Google it and then put PDF at the end, you'll be able to get a free version of it. And then The Plausibility Problem by Ed Shaw talks really underneath all of what he's talking about is the theme of living for God as a single and putting Jesus first in your singleness. Now he comes at it from a same-sex attraction end of things, but it's that theme of living for God um, in singleness. And I'd really highly recommend that. If you'd like to stand, as we finish, let me just say some things about you. Before you are single, before you are married, before you are a husband or a wife, before you are a teacher or a nurse or an office manager or whatever you do, before you are any of the things that you can be labelled by, you are a son. With Jesus, you are all in sonship. There is no male and female. There is no, there is no hierarchy. We are all children who he wanted to know so much that he died for us. You're his precious son or daughter this morning who he wants to know more and more. As you know him, he wants you to live free in this area. Free from idolatry and free to see this whole thing as good and as he intended it to be. Lord Jesus, as we worship you right now, bring home again. Actually bring some of us home again. And bring home again how you feel about us. That whole theme of Romans 8, which I am just rediscovering. That we're your sons and daughters. That we're in, we're we're cocooned in. That by the Holy Spirit, as we know you more, Holy Spirit, we're going to know more and more of a freedom from slavery, a freedom from fear, and a freedom to love you, live for you, worship you. So I pray right now, Lord, right across this room, whatever people's history, whatever their past, whatever they're feeling, whatever is in their heart right now, Lord, they would know more than anything else how much you love them right now, how you feel about them right now. Lord, I pray against guilt. I pray against shame. I say to condemnation, be gone in Jesus' name. If you've asked for forgiveness and repented and turned away from stuff, then shame and condemnation was never for you anyway, and it definitely isn't for you now. You are a daughter. You are a son. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship.